Welcome to Grammar of Classical Chinese Between Philology and Typology. This is the second lecture in the November block of Methods in Sinology lecture series, focusing on the topic of historical linguistics. Uh, Methods in Sinology is a lecture series organized through the Institute of Asian and Oriental Studies at the University of Zurich and the East Asian Languages and Civilizations Department at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, the aim of this series is to organize a virtual space where specialists in a range of subfields of Sinology can share their methodologies um, and their specific tools and methods they've adopted to approach research problems. Um, I thank the organizers, Mariana Zorkina and Madalena Poli, who are also here. Um, the Methods in Sinology lecture series would not be possible without their work. My name is Bryce Heatherly. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Pennsylvania. And I work mainly on art and material culture, uh, mainly from the middle period of China, so uh, Tang Song transition. And I will be the chair for this lecture given by Dr. Lucas Sadrapa. Um, and because of a, the technical glitch last week, I did not have a chance to introduce our speaker properly. So I'll take the chance to do that now. Um, Dr. Zadrapa completed his doctorate at Charles University in Prague, where he is currently head of the Department of Sinology. He is a specialist in historical linguistics of classical Chinese, uh, theories and histories of Chinese writing and ancient Chinese literature and philosophy. Dr. Zadrapa lectures on linguistics and translation and his published works include translations of the Shunzi and the Han Feizi. His book, uh, Word Class Flexibility in Classical Chinese, Verbal and Adverbial Uses of Nouns, which we were introduced to during last week's lecture, uh, was published by Brill in 2011 and examines the infamous issue of word class flexibility, drawing on his strong theoretical background in cognitive linguistics. Um, so those who have listened to these lectures and want to learn more about ancient Chinese grammar and syntax, word classes, as well as sources on early inscriptions and excavated texts, are also encouraged to check out Dr. Zadrapa's wonderful entry in Oxford Bibliographies in Chinese Studies, which is titled The Ancient Chinese Language. Um, so with that, I invite everyone to join me in welcoming Dr. Zadrapa. Uh, Dr. Zadrapa, I hand it over to you. Oh, thank you very much for uh, for introduction. Uh, this time it, 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 it was very fine <laughs> uh, without any problem, uh, technical problems. So I'll just uh, uh, jump back to uh, to the place I, I stopped uh, next time. Uh, I have made a, a new handout because according to the to the pace of, of the talk uh, the last time. So uh, and uh, I uh, so I'll show you show you my screen again uh, with this one. Uh, I anticipated some anticipated some problems or deficiencies of my former former handouts so I compensated for them and also I have a short section uh, regarding the question that were that were asked uh, during my talk of, or after my talk so uh, we'll continue uh, 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 with grammar of classical Chinese uh, and with measuring degree of nominalization uh, I I showed you uh, TLS database uh, last time, and I spoke about the ro role it played in in this in this research, this kind of research. And but I did not uh, work with it uh, to to find good examples of nominalized, nominalized verbs. I uh, I was speaking about the its its uh, character character of the of the database that it is a very sophisticated sophisticated system but it is not a, a corpus uh, uh, it is not an annotated corpus it means that uh, the system is uh, very fine grained uh, uh, the most sophisticated one but uh, there is no systematic uh, tagging there but uh, 
it is very, uh, I would say it is very haphazard. Sometimes, uh, sometimes one of the analyzers uh, comes across a, a, a sentence with, a, with an interesting uh, construction. And so he thinks that it is a, uh, that it would be nice if it would be attributed in the system. And so uh, some, some texts are analyzed very systematically, but other texts only just few words uh, in a chapter and so on. So it is. Uh, um, it is. Uh, it can be used for for statistical uh, research and so on. But one can one can uh, look for good examples of certain categories. So when I uh, when I uh, uh, try to uh, find some some of these, so I uh, uh, in that case I looked for a special category. An AB uh, I talked about uh, last time as well already, uh, which is an abstract noun and with a semantic category ext action uh, action noun, uh, which this NAB means that is a mono monosyllabic uh, word. But for uh, for uh, nominalized clauses, uh, not nominalized verbs, uh, one can try. Uh, searching for the synthetic category in NPAB, which is noun phrased, abstract noun phrase, which uh, which in its core is a sentence, nominalized sentence. So this is this another label, a syntactic category one can uh, one can use. And then uh, I was trying to uh, find uh, examples or where the given verb was nominalized, but there were, and uh, there was a uh, uh, the agent or patient of the original verb was coded as a, as a, as its possessor. It means like like one just sing. Let us say this is the king's behavior. Uh, so I try to fi uh, find out uh, these cases, for example, of uh, of this uh, so-called object genitive and uh, subject genitive in, in classical Chinese. So one can search for this uh, special function of J. I will show you, I will show you immediately. Yes, I think before I, uh, I uh, go on, so I'll just uh, switch, uh, switch to, uh, switch to TLS uh, once again. And yeah, this is this you can browse here. Uh, this is this browse function here, when one can uh, one can search concept that means these uh, let us say synonym groups characters. This is like a dictionary and syntactic function and semantic uh, features and also rhetorical devices, which is a unique feature of of this database. Because Christoph Harsmeier uh, has been. Uh, very much interested in, in uh, uh, re rhetorics in, in ancient China and in ancient Greece as well. So uh, that's why it is here. And for example, uh, the analects, uh, analects are analyzed, I think, completely for rhetorical devices. So I can recommend it uh, to you. But uh, let's, let's choose these syntactic functions and we can try to, uh, to look for this label and AB. Uh, which uh, um, we have an AB, and there are, I think, that there must be some technical problem here because we are only several, uh, several uh, words here. You can see that this. Uh, the, extremely many attributions that means that some that somebody found somewhere in a text uh, a good example of uh, an abstract noun and and connected it with a system so attributed attributed uh, the this uh, analytic label with a concrete uh, concrete uh, occurrence or word in a text and for example we can see uh, here for example that we have uh, let us say this nab feature here uh, nab act that's what we are looking for it, it means uh, that uh, lu is uh, of course it is it is a verb but, but it can be a noun as well nominalized expression uh, or the, the verbal noun, action noun, 
and with a meaning thoughts about the future. I think it is a bit in, uh, imprecise because it is actually not an action action noun because it is not the very action of thinking, but it is uh, a mixture of of the very process of thinking, but uh, also of the things that are thought about, as I would say. So it is not a pure action noun, for example. Or we have, a, for example, for adjectives, um, I, I say adjectives because I think there is a, uh, there is a word class of adjectives in classical Chinese, but for, for TLS, there, there are only nouns and verbs uh, in this, uh, in, uh, in this uh, uh, domain of, uh, of empty, uh, or sorry, of, of full full words so uh, adjectives are coded normally as verbs intransitive verbs but here you can see it is a uh, it is an abstract noun uh, with the meaning this is a feature so it is an abstract uh, denotation uh, of the property so the fact of being far away of, of it can be even a distance and so on so this is uh, this is this is the first possibility uh, one, can, one can try many other uh, combinations where this, where you have this is this pure, uh, pure and, and the simplest, uh, simplest annotation for an isolated uh, abstract noun. But of course, this abstract noun can be in various constructions. It can be an object of a verb. It can be a, it can be, a, for example, a predicate, a nominal predicate. It can be an adnominal modifier, and so on and so on. It can be an adverb, adverbial modifier. So one can try, uh, try anything. For example, here we we have, let us say, e, this, uh, which is itself. Uh, it is not an action noun, but it is, but it's an abstract noun. Let us say for. Uh, for the mind being, for the moment being, we can we can have a look at this one particular word, and you can see that it can be used adverbially. This is adv that means adverbial modification by means of rectitude acting in accordance with the duty, and we can have a look that that where this word uh, in this that this word in this function particle function where it occurs so it is in shoyan itun duho with this rectitude he made a few lords into flowers of his uh, so there are many uh, there are many possibilities here but of course it is it it cannot be uh, said to be automated it is a just uh, just uh, uh, just a nice support, uh, but one has to go manually through all, through all these labels and to sort them out. But still, I think it is very, very useful. We can uh, we can uh, try to search for this uh, in, in PAB uh, with this supplementary symbol for a sentence. And again, this is a construction of a uh, verbal phrase plus this uh, this nominalized nominalized sentence. So we can have a look, for example, for this. Uh, it is not not the. Uh, I cannot see any good examples there. It is uh, is not a good example here. You can have a look at the pure, the simplest label. You can. See. You can see, for example, here. Uh, yes, we show here we will found uh, transitive uh, verbs, which take a nominalized sentence as, as its object. So now we are not looking for the nominalized sentences themselves, but for the verbs, verbs that govern them. So we can see, for example, is to be afraid of that, be scared, and we. Uh, uh, we expect that we will find a nominalized clause after this verb. And so let, let us say, yeah, there are so many, uh, there are so many examples here. You can see that we have this uh, to, to be afraid that something is happening, so uh, or something will happen. I'm afraid he will increase the the uh, disorder and so and so on. So uh, we can uh, we can also. Uh, draw on this material as well, just as illustrative examples, of course, no, no, no statistics. And the last one, uh, this is this, uh, and maybe the simplest way I, I, I do it is to go through the, through some kind of text. 
for example, that my students and to uh, look at the particle G, which So let us <laughs> uh, wait uh, a minute. This is always the worst step that takes uh, the most time. I told Christoph Habsman many times it is a bit frustrating, but <laughs> maybe it is. It cannot be done anything with this as, as it is. Sorry for the delay, but it is. I hope it it is not my fault or of my my computer. So from for some reason this takes too much time. So maybe I'll ask it this one. Maybe we can we can come to this later. Uh, I'm not sure why. Why this doesn't why this doesn't work? Maybe computers overloaded all the, the internet here. Uh, so let's let's go back to my to my PowerPoint presentation. Well, but certainly, simply the the general message is that uh, this uh, TLS database can be used for these purposes uh, quite fruitfully. But uh, I, uh, because we were talking about this uh, weak nominalization or slight nominalization, I use this, that that word, but maybe it's much better to speak uh, about weak nominalization and strong nominalization, uh, which is a kind of scale. That was something I emphasized that this is in fact there are many grades of normalizations uh, degrees of normalization then we we should and could, could and should measure them because so so that we are able to understand the language more precisely uh, uh, on one side this is this syntax -like, syntax like phenomena uh, and pure syntax and uh, uh, the other side on the other hand we have this lexicon like processes uh, which instead of inflection um, can be described as word formation, in fact. So this, this is the continu continuum between syntax and lexicon, I would say. Uh, and uh, here we have uh, some terms that are very often used uh, on this scale. Uh, first of all, we have these balanced, uh, balanced predicates or balanced sentences or balanced verbs, which simply are independent in independent sentences, the main predicates without any sense of uh, uh, dependence or embedding or whatever. Uh, then we have these daring verbs, but still, uh, still verbs, I would say, with weak nominalization and strong nominalization. And um, maybe the most, uh, the best way to how to speak about it uh, is to say that this kind, these kind of verbs are normal verbs, balanced verbs. Then we have subordination as uh, uh, as uh, I don't know now with this Christopher or Kapiskaya was this book on subordination. So this this all are expressions that still has the verbal core, but in a sense it is already uh, somewhat nominal, nominalized, all these embedded clauses and so on. Then we have this strong nominalization is the real nominalization, uh, which uh, which uh, refers only to really pure pure nouns, the clear nouns. Uh, and not to gerunds and infinitives and so on, or for example, uh, for example, complement, complement clauses, let us say. And under nominalization, we have various kinds of nominalization. We have action nouns, we, as we talked about it last time, for example, this uh, run and run, <laughs> uh, which means uh, or hunt, ha, to hunt and hunt this action noun. This is noun that that denotes uh, the that activity as a kind of abstract thing. Then we have model no, uh, model nouns uh, or model action nouns, in fact, and these are uh, actually a majority of uh, action nouns because usually uh, the noun doesn't mean the uh, when it is really. Uh, when it is a real uh, noun and a not some kind of infinitive that usually it means 
uh, not only the the activity itself but uh, the way something is is done so for example here a uh, sing read as sing as it's not just uh, acting but it is a kind of behavior usual and uh, very often it means simply good behavior or uh, elegant behavior and so on. And then we have uh, also agent nouns, for example, yin means to govern, but only govern, let us say. Uh, we have this patient nominalizations as we have uh, chuan to transmit and juan document something that is transmitted and instrument nouns as well. There we have this duo, which means to measure, but we have in an instrument noun to uh, uh, measure or a standard. So, these kind of nominalizations are uh, relatively uh, relatively different uh, from this kind of weak nominalization, which we uh, we preferably uh, would call subordination. In fact. So uh, I think that's uh, actually that was my uh, that was my introduction to my first talk. That uh, that people tend to speak about nominalization uh, in very different ways with very different meanings. So I, I think we maybe should uh, uh, make this more orderly. <laughs> uh, here, uh, I uh, uh, there are some uh, examples from English that this blends this they hunt or they are hunting. The subordination is that they hunt or that they are hunting. This is only weak nominalization. Then we have them hunting, which is a, a bit more nominalized. Uh, uh, then, then we have bear hunting, which is already coming close to a real, uh, real uh, action noun. This kind of hunting, and the last stage of nominalization is real action noun, hunt as, as a noun. And uh, for classical Chinese, we can, uh, sorry, examples which are some kind kind of parallel examples to that English, uh, to this English scale. But English is a language that is, uh, that has a very, uh, uh, very fine grained scale of nominalization in most other languages. Uh, there are, uh, there are less possible positions on this scale because they are not differentiated, distinguished by morphosyntax or morphology. So, for example, for classical Chinese, I have these this three positions that he has balanced Wang Xingzheng, the king in explicit. This is very not good English translations, but sorry for that. <laughs> uh, then we have this during subordinated, where we have, for example, Wang Zhe, Xing Zheng Ye, Shan Yi, the way the king in explicit is fine, that is, Xing uh, is still a verb, but it is already deranged, which can be seen on this Zhe, which makes it uh, dependent, this, this Wang Xing Zhe becomes a dependent clause uh, and it becomes the topic of the sentence. The king's enacting policies is fine, would be maybe a more, pre uh, more precise translation. And then the last stage uh, is nominalized, lexicalized, where we have this Wang Zhe Xing Shan, where we, we can see that it is, uh, it is morphologically marked by the suffix S, which evolved in the fourth tone now. Uh, so we have this Wang Zhe Xing. The king's behavior is fine. Uh, and, it, uh, it, and Wang Zhe Xing can mean the king's behavior, but also the king's good behavior, which is already a lexicalized feature of that uh, already well entrenched uh, noun. So this is the last stage. Uh, we can see, uh, we can say, of course, also Wang Xing Shan, the behavior of kings, uh, of kings is fine. This Wang Xing tends to be a compound uh, or instead of a, instead of a, a nominal phrase. And we, we could even translate this, this uh, particular sentence as kingly behavior is fine. So then this is another step in, in this process of de-verbalization of of the original verb seem to to go and trend, uh, and causatively to enact and so uh, so there is something i wanted to emphasize once again that we have this the scale and that we maybe sh uh, should speak about subordination and organization as separate issues um, 
uh, one thing that uh, seems to be uni universal to uh, and typologists uh, describe these phenomena, um, including that book on subordination and, and uh, nominalization by Christofaro and uh, Kapivskaya Tam, uh, we can see that uh, the, the more, the more uh, uh, nominalized a verb is, uh, the more different coding of participants of the action uh, can be seen. Uh, first of all, the, the, the may be a reduction of participants because when a verb is uh, completely nominalized, it usually cannot retain its original valency structure. So uh, maybe there will be only uh, the agent or the patient, but it usually, uh, usually it does not allow uh, for an agent and patient instruments to, to occur with a nominalized verb uh, at the same time. Usually there are some restrictions. So this is redu uh, the reduction of participants. And then we have different coding of participants. You can, uh, I have three languages here again, this English, uh, Latin and, and Chinese. We can see these, uh, these various stages of nominalization. We have this agent and patient and they hunt has or they are hunting a hunting has uh, subject they is in nominative uh, uh, and it is really real subject and uh, we have an accusative object uh, uh, which call these agent and patient in English in, in a normal sentence uh, here we have uh, this kind of uh, and that they are hunting has this is the same so this is the weakest nominalization but still already a slight nominalization which is subordination uh, in, a, in a sense and then we have this uh, already a, a more pr pr pronounced uh, nominalization process and you can see them to hunt has or them hunting has uh, I, I can see them hunting hunting has let us say so uh, here the agent the patient stays in accusative that's why we still feel it is a verb and it is a verbal core but uh, the agent agent is already in that uh, this them instant of they uh, another step there is that uh, uh, the, uh, the patient stays coded as an, an accusative object here it is has but there becomes genitive or possessor uh, their hunting of hares. This is uh, already, uh, already almost the last stage, and it is uh, it is cross linguistically very common that uh, both uh, that agent and patient, uh, one of them becomes uh, genitive. Here, English is very special in that sense that it can have two. Uh, it can. Uh, take two genitive, this hunting there and of hers. It can both uh, agent, the agent and the patient are allowed to, to occur, but uh, many languages do not allow this. Either you have uh, the agent or the patient coded as this possessor genitive. Yes, but this is um, at least it is uh, this, this is. Uh, uh, this is asserted in, in typological literature that uh, English is quite special in this respect. And in the very head, uh, the very last step is that uh, agent is uh, coded as genitive there, uh, but uh, the object is incorporated into a compound. So we have this hair hunt, either with a hyphen or without it. Usually, I think this without it. But so, sorry for minor mistakes in orthography <laughs> and uh, some even uh, worse, uh, worse uh, mistakes in, in English. And something something similar can be seen on on Latin, where you this is, of course this uh, this pronominal uh, pronominal subject uh, is is not. Uh, is not necessary here, but if it appears, so it is of course in nominative, is lepores venator. Uh, so it is the same, he here he uh, hunts has, or he is hunting has. And uh, in, uh, in another step in this nominalization process is where he have this uh, with infinitive uh, with uh, accusatives. So we have two accusatives, uh, one, one, encodes the agent and the other encodes the patient. And uh, the last uh, the last step is so that we, we, we have this venatio, which means hunt, uh, hunting. 
uh, or venatus, real nouns, uh, uh, action nouns. And then we have uh, the object in, in, in any case would be in genitive, like porum, this is of, of has. Uh, but then I, I doubt uh, that there that can be uh, the uh, agent as well. I think Aeus Leporum Venatio is a bit uh, awkward, but of course no, I'm not a native Latin speaker, so <laughs> I, I won't decide now, but I think it's a bit strange. And uh, in, uh, in Chinese, we have a, we have a quite, similar uh, quite similar scale. Uh, the normal sentence would be, we, can, we want to say uh, he he his hunting has he hunts has that will be uh, uh, zero rear two because we don't have any any uh, third pe person pr uh, pronoun for uh, the subject of an uh, of an independent sentence, but uh, once uh, it uh, gets into the position, for example, of a complement clause then uh, it can appear as qi, so I know, so wujie qi lie tu, I know that he hunts, <laughs> hunts uh, has, so uh, uh, in this case, the agent is called it as genitive, let us say genitive or possessor, uh, and, but the patient still remains the accusative uh, normal uh, coding, and it is after the verb, so this is kind of, this is partly nominal, because we have this T, but partly still verbal. So this is the subordination. You can say this is uh, this big kind of nominalization of subordination. Uh, nothing changes here. So we don't have any, uh, so it is very, it is not easy to distinguish between uh, subordination and real nominalization. But in the end, we would have, for example, the compound Tulia hunter, and we, that would be very uh, similar to that English example there, her hunt. It would be the same, his or their uh, her hunt. So uh, we can see that this kind of parallelism. And uh, uh, if one if one wishes to look uh, for to look for examples of these processes, it is uh, it is maybe uh, it is maybe. Uh, most appropriate to try uh, Academia Sinica Corpus. I will come to this uh, uh, in a while, but still I will, uh, I will, I am going to speak about this kind of processes where we have, we, we have this just subordination, but not the uh, strongest nominalization. Uh, we can see that in classical Chinese, usually uh, uh, nothing happens in subordination, subordination uh, except of uh, adding this particle of, of the de uh, dependency that uh, makes this cause um, not an independent uh, sentence, but it turns the, ind the independent se sentence into a dependent one. So this is a marker of dependency, but of course it is uh, homonymous with genitive particle and it does give sense. Right? Yeah, because the fact that the, the king, that king is, uh, that the king killed uh, a dog means also, it, in, a, in a sense, it means the king's killing of, of a dog. So this uh, parallel possessor or genitive and dependent marking is, is logical from, from this type of typological point of view. So we have, uh, th this is a sentence I, I, I made up uh, because I, <laughs> um, but uh, I think it is realistic, uh, re realistic one. So we have this king killed uh, a dog uh, with a weapon in the ancestral temple. So we have this instrument, uh, we have this uh, a patient, this direct object, and we have a, a locative complement or in this locative, uh, locative object, let us say. And uh, what, if if we try to turn this uh, this verb sha into a into a, or we try to subordinate it. So the only thing that happens is this this particle. But otherwise, uh, the coding of the of the uh, agent stays the same. The coding of the object stays the same. So it is uh, uh, this chuan, this dog. It is still after the verb. So uh, we can see that this sha is not a noun in a proper sense. It is something between verb and a noun, but still it retains the uh, uh, most of the properties of the verb. It can have an instrumental. Uh, uh, it can have uh, an instrumental. Uh, 
a prepositional phrase, it can have a normal accusative object, it can, it can govern a, a complement of place and so on. So one can see that uh, not, nothing, not, that there is not, not much change here. Uh, th this can be said, uh, this, can, this can be said about uh, passive sentences as well. We have this uh, uh, the dog was killed by the king, but here this, uh, even this marker of passive uh, in classical Chinese. And uh, the same, the same process with the same, uh, with the same results uh, applies to this. So uh, in classical Chinese, I would say that uh, maybe it is not this agent patient, the semantic role that are really sensitive, but it is the subject or object here. Uh, yeah, because here this uh, Wang is the agent and here Quan is the patient, he is killed, but the coding, coding is the same in, the, in both cases. So uh, it, is, it is not, uh, clear enough that we should concentrate our, uh, ourselves on, for example, those semantic roles, but we should uh, take uh, this um, grammatical uh, roles, this syntactic roles uh, into consideration as well. So not to, uh, not to ignore uh, subjects and objects and so on. Uh, here I have some examples I can think of, uh, uh, where we have this Lie or Sha, if it became really nominalized as a real strong nominalization that means action nouns or modal nouns, uh, we, we could have any, uh, we could have a compound where the first, uh, where the first uh, uh, word uh, would, could be any kind of the original, let us say original or semantic, uh, part of the original event. So here, this Turie, Herhang, this is the object of the, uh, of the, uh, of hunting. He, this Chuensha maybe doesn't mean the killing of a dog, but maybe rather dog massacre, because it is a, <laughs> uh, it is a compound noun, which um, is conceptualized as a whole. Again, Miao Sha, here the Miao, Miao is the place where the killing takes place, and can be the killing in the ancestor temple, but maybe it can also be a kind of regular action, this uh, ancestral temple massacres. <laughs> and uh, again, uh, Pingsha, I can, I can imagine such a, such a compound uh, where the first, uh, first component of the com compound is the, the original instrument. So in this setting, then we have this the strongest nominalization where we have uh, is incorporation. Uh, we have this basic uh, action noun is killing or hunting and another, another, uh, another uh, word which forms a compound with, together with it. So, uh, uh, and it can have any, any, any role, it can be in any cementing relationship with the, uh, with the action now, as you, as you can see. And then uh, one, I, I am not, uh, I haven't, uh, I haven't uh, studied it yet uh, uh, in, in a detail, but I asked myself, I'm ask, asking myself, what, uh, uh, what kind of constructions Kasuka Chinese allows us? I can imagine that we have, for example, Wang Lie, which is kingly, kingly hunts. We can have this uh, uh, Wang Julie, king's hunting, let us say. So this is the, uh, this is the genitive of the, the subject genitive. Wang is the subject of the, of the original verb Lie. Here is this uh, object uh, genitive, some classical theology calls it uh, uh, this, hunting of hairs, hunt, hunt hairs, but it, these hairs are the patience <laughs> of the hunting. Uh, so I can, uh, I can imagine very well these, uh, these constructions, but then I am not quite, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure uh, which degree compl complexity, complexity is allowed by classical Chinese, whether we can have, for example, Wang Zhe, so this is, that would mean hair hunts done by kings, or, <laughs> or whether we can have Tuja Wang Lie, that can have this, this king's hunting of, of hairs. I think we cannot uh, have this uh, complex construction, but one, one, uh, one must, uh, one, 
uh, one must prove this by searching uh, and and a corpus because without that one cannot one cannot say but uh, one one cannot tell so another uh, 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 another part of this small theory is that uh, of course it, it is not always always easy to tell whether uh, the given thing this original verb is only subordinated or it is really nominalized and it is lexicalized as a as a, as a noun whether we should put it in a dictionary as a noun let us say but we have we have several criteria we can rely on but none of which is totally reliable but when combined i think it's it works relatively well it is morphology frequency lexical semantics and distribution properties First of all, we have morphology, uh, but uh, for for the purposes of this particular study, it is not so uh, uh, useful because usually uh, um, there, there, what is marked in classical Chinese by by a morpheme uh, in classical Chinese these are, are those other types of nominalization, agent nominalization, subject nominalization, patient, and so on. We can see, for example, Changsheng to write and carry it, for example. So this is the instrument now, let us say. We have this chuan juan, we have to transmit, and what is transmitted, what is tra transmitted document. Uh, again, we have this instrument nominalization tu and tuo. You can see, you can see that usually it is the s suffix which turns, uh, turns uh, verbs into nouns, but not always. We have this quite complicated problem with this as suffix, but still this is the most usual process in a morphological process in classical Chinese, we reconstruct. Uh, 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 and the same is true, for example, for adjectives as non, uh, difficult and difficulty, let us say. So it doesn't, it doesn't work, for example, for the real action nouns. But I can, I can think uh, of at least one <laughs> I used here, uh, I have been using here consistently and all the time, and it is this seeing and seeing. Where really seeing is to act and uh, seeing is behavior, a kind of acting. So it is not a pure action noun, but it is at least modal noun, is a kind of acting. And then, for example, for some for some adjectives, there are readings attested in medieval sources that show that in that at least in the medieval period, these uh, uh, those adjectives uh, were, could have been pronounced uh, differently in different functions. For example, here we have this shen, which uh, has not retained uh, the uh, the reading shen which comes from this thum and thums should be shen and shen in the fourth one, but uh, this pronunciation is not attested uh, anymore here, unlike sing, which is traditionally used in reading classical Chinese. But we know that this, this process maybe was, uh, could have, might have been, might have been uh, quite uh, common in classical Chinese. We don't know because we don't have sources in our, but still depth, could have been pronounced like thumbs, this is shen. And then we have a different process, but this is the opposite direction, I would say, that we have this, uh, this wang, which is not a verb, but a noun. And we have this morphological process of turning this noun into, into a verb. So we can just notice this, this kind of thing that it really happens, that this is king and to become the true king. And only, uh, only rarely it means just to rule, but almost always it means to, to become the true king. So uh, at least we can see that uh, there was, uh, obviously there was some kind of uh, still, at least uh, uh, let us say productive morphological processes. Maybe it was only that this S suffix that was that was uh, productive in the warring states period, and all the other prefixes and suffixes were already dead <laughs> and uh, unproductive, uh, and it was just retentions from from Proto Chinese period period, let us say. But this S function, so it can be used to distinguish this uh, subordination from real nominalization, let us say. There are, of course, very complicated cases here. For example, we can we can see, uh, uh, for example, that this this can work in 
this can be done in some kind of cycles, various to understand. And then we have two words that are read uh, reconstructed as stress uh, uh, for, for the classical period. And uh, so it, the, uh, the chain of uh, the chain of derivation might have been to understand to be intelligent and intelligence and there is no morphological difference between the distinction between intelligent intelligent and intelligence but maybe uh, my, maybe more logical would be this to understand to derive a noun uh, intelligence from this, and then we have we would have uh, another round of, uh, in this case, verbalization <laughs> to be intelligent. So, of course, this is a very complicated method is uh, in ancient Chinese morphology, but one should take it into consideration because without that, I, I think one is half blind. I would say because uh, the characters, of course, are only a way of writing those words, and we uh, really uh we really uh, should appreciate that the language was not so isolating and uh, rigid one as it appears from the modern way of how uh, those classical chinese texts are read traditionally uh, i have some uh, some i i explained this uh, these other criteria here uh, I very briefly just frequency I say that that if a verbal noun or something that maybe is subordinate subordinated verb or already uh, already a real noun, well entrenched, uh, uh, lexicalized, uh, listed uh, in noun that can can figure a figure feature in a, in a dictionary. So that usually that usually it is frequently enough in the extant corpus. Uh, it signals that it is very probably lexicalized, but but of course it is very relative and uh, subjective, and uh, of course it can be applied to only uh, on a small part of the expression under scrutiny because many verbs are attested, for example, five times or ten times uh, in uh, in the extant text, and that uh, that cannot be used this kind of statistics to prove anything whether it is a verb or it is a noun so it can be uh, applied only on those most frequent uh, nouns verbs let's say and we have this criterion of lexical semantics because traditionally even morphological products a bit exhibits a semantic aberration that is not perfectly transparent it can be computed on the basis of syntactic productive rules it is usually deemed a coinage of a word for initial type so uh, of course if 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 syntax and uh, the uh, and does not uh, is not enough to uh, our knowledge of syntax is not enough to in interpret uh, an expression, and we and there are other layers of meaning, uh, which which is conventional and always present. So this is a kind of expression we simply have to learn by heart that meaning. We cannot rely only on syntax. So, and very often this is, I think, for example, that even this gerunds uh, in in English and. Uh, is real nouns, uh, action nouns, are not the same. For example, that is that uh, always uh, the real noun is something more, more highly, more conceptualized, and there are other meanings that are uh, not present in in the gerund. Racing is simply, let us say, it is simply and purely the process of of racing but races is something that has some beginning some end some typical features uh, whole races for example we can imagine the whole scenario of horse races and so on it is already something that we are used to think about that's why it it uh, it, uh, it was it was nominalized and why why it was coined in, in fact the, si the, si the the same thing is for example with loving and love of course it is very close, but it is not the same. One is the, the very process of loving, but love is a kind of material for us that we can measure and that um, there are many other meanings associated with it, culture ones and, and so on. So it is co already conceptualized as a kind of thing or material. The same is that education is, is not only teaching. So uh, so this is, these all are distinctions that uh, sh should, be, uh, should be heeded. I even I, I told you last time that I don't like those people telling that, for example, love is uh, 
the noun love is a no, no, cannot be that we cannot use this semantic uh, semantic analysis uh, analysis to prove that something is a verb or something something is a noun because love is a noun but it uh, denotes a process but this that is the mistake <laughs> that uh, love as a noun does not denote a, uh, does not denote a process but it is a thing that has this process as its conceptual basis but it is not the 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 process it is a thing for us that's a very abstract thing but still it is a thing and this is the same with teaching and educational producing and production these are simply different words uh, with uh, with different distribution with different uh, uh, occurring in different context and collocations and so on so it is not the same and then we have distributional properties because once something is uh, well entrenched as a noun so it behaves as a noun for example so it is often um, it often, uh, for example, acquires an attribute uh, and so on. So, for example, uh, let us say, for example, he sing, which is already clearly lexicalized uh, uh, on the basis of the criterion of morphology, because we now know it's a sing. So it appears, appears let's say, 366 times uh, in uh, more than 100 compounds of this kind. So we have like kind of uh, words like the sing, for example, so this virtuous, virtuous behavior and so and so on. So and once this, this, this particular word appears as a nominal head in a compound, so one can presume that it, it is a quite good noun. On the other hand, those verbs that do not, that are not uh, nominalized uh, in this in this conventional uh, manner, it, they they still uh, has have not become regular nouns. So they usually do not uh, do not um, show this this special kind of behavior. So these all these, these criteria can can all be uh, employed to to assess the degree of. Uh, lexicalization and then peace, but to decide whether we have this kind uh, a case of subordination of nominalization. Uh, uh, and uh, here I have uh, here I have this. Uh, I can show you what what I intend to do, and I try to do for some uh, for some words in Academia Sinica uh, uh, tech corpus of classical Chinese uh, that one can. Thing of verbs that might be actually uh, might have been uh, nominalized and to look for these characters, uh, but with the nominal uh, part of speech labels. So we can uh, search for uh, for the character sin uh, or word sin, uh, but in its nominal uh, nominal uh, function. So and then we uh, of course we we will have to sort out various problematic. Uh, uh, concordances, for example, instances with the nominal expression before the nominalized verb, because uh, I, in these cases, I, I, I will, I, I intend to look for this nominalized, nominalized verb and it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's agent or uh, patient or instrument uh, coded as its genitive before you. But then I uh, I will have to sort out instances with the nominal. Uh, so so this is other uh, sorry. So I will look for instances with a nominal expression before the nominalized verb. But I will have to discard cases with pronouns in this position because uh, this is uh, this is problematic. For example, we we will uh, we we will get. We, we, we will get uh, things like shushing this this kind of behavior, for example, and we, we don't want to get uh, such collocations. And we, we, we can uh, search for instances with the before the nominalized verb. Well, this kind of wang zhe, wang zhe sing, behavior of the king. But that uh, in that case, we will have to sort out only cases with a noun before that zhe and not other uh, parts of speech uh, and so on. And then we have to manually process the results, which simply is, uh, um, uh, I, I, I do not know of any of any corpora, uh, corpora of classical Chinese that would allow us to, to do this uh, automatically. As I told you last time, this is the best thing I, I think we have. 
uh, but uh, it is tagged only for for parts of speech and not for uh, for instance for uh, for syntactic roles. Uh, so I will show you uh, the process. This academic corp, uh, this this corpus of uh, Academia Sinica. Uh, uh, which has yes, a in English, but English doesn't function for many years. <laughs> and here, for example, you can you can choose the texts uh, from the corpus. I usually work only with real classic, real, real boring states. Oh, of course, it is a problem. It's very difficult to say what is a real authentic uh, warring states text, but usually I take, for example, uh, uh, sometimes Changwatsu, although it is a, it is a cont controversial thing, and then maybe Yenz and maybe Kwanza, let us say. Because these are pre-classical uh, or problemat or the uh, or Han Han time texts, so or very uh, very problematic textologically. So we can we can look, for example, for this uh, for this uh, Sin or Sha. We can start with Sha, for example, uh, with. Uh, with nominal uh, with nominal properties and let us let us look how how many nominal shas uh, we can find here so we have 47 nominal shas here and then of course uh, we get various various strange things here but we can sort them sort these cases out for example we can say that we we want to um, have uh, cases where uh, there is a, there is a known before this particular word uh, seeing behavior. So here this uh, this be, there will be any word which is which is a noun to the to one one word left to the to the word seeing. So uh, this is minus one and minus one it means the first word to the left of the the expression the original expression we look for uh, yeah. so and this would be another step and we get only these ones uh, only with uh, with pr with uh, with pronoun uh, for example, we can see we, have, we, we, we don't have to sort out the cases without pronoun because there are, there, there are not so many examples here. And you can see that uh, here, for example, we have this face so to, uh, to enjoy uh, his killing. So we would have to look at the text and to the context whether this is um, uh, this is subject uh, uh, subject or the original subject or object object of, of the killing, for instance. But this is the way how to get to the, to very many examples of what we are looking for simply to those uh, nominalized verb with its uh, with its agent or patient instrument to the left coded as in, in genitive. Of course, we can try, for example, another search where here. We will have the word J. Yeah. So this is the one one character to the left will be J. Oh, so there are there are no such examples. We can try, for example, this, this, that will be better. We can try for this this ubiquitous thing. Uh, which it is more interesting because it is already uh, it is one thousand already almost two thousand uh, cases of this, and then we can sort out cases where there is a 
we have this word chill to the left. Uh, And so already the first case, but this is the Shangshu. I don't know because I did not tick uh, tick off Shangshu, so <laughs> it doesn't matter now. But you can see already Ryuji Sin. So this is the literally the walks. Of course, this is the movements of uh, of uh, the sun and the moon, and it means this is the uh, this agent agent reading and and so and so on. But we can of course can have, uh, for example, the jasing, which would mean uh, the enacting of virtue, and that would be object reading and so on. Uh, as I told you, this another step would be to sort out cases where here we have a noun because we are looking for other uh, subjects or, or agents or patients or instruments or places here at this position that are coded as attributes to the uh, verbal noun. So we, we, can, uh, we can say that uh, we look for any, that we do, uh, look only for cases where there is a noun here at this position, minus two, this is, will be minus two. And our, we will have less less work, manual work with this. Let us try show. So we have only 390 cases where you have this uh, sing or sing. In any case, uh, tagged as a noun as a noun here in this corpus with the je before it and with a uh, with a noun before it. For example, uh, in in this list, we already can uh, we can already process it quite systematically and to categorize those cases where we have this uh, uh, subject genitives, object genitives, instrument genitives, and so on. There are so many genitives in TLS in the system. There are maybe 20, uh, 20, uh, 20 kinds of genitive and uh, maybe five of them apply to genitives before a uh, verbal noun as well. Cause this, for example, tata or just tata or just sing, yes. So it is different from re, re, just sing or sing rather here. These are these two kinds of sing. <laughs> one is movement and one is the behavior, and one is red sing, and the other is red sing traditionally. And tata or just sing, it is uh, this tata is actually in let us say patient, patient or these object, direct objects of sing, because we walk uh uh we walk on a, uh, on a, on a way, sing ta ta. It will be like this. Yes. So the, these are uh, good. Uh, 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 these are nice tool. This is a nice tool to uh, to look systematically for for the possibilities which classical Chinese ha uh, has to encode different. Uh, different original participant of that event now expressed by uh, by a nominal verb or denominal verb. So we can we, we can uh, we can try to determine whether there is this uh, uh, reduction reduction of uh, participants, which is evident because classical Chinese does not like two genitives like xiao, like uh, I don't know. Uh, let us say xiao zi, xiao zi zhe, zhe xing, that would be, for example, that it would mean that this is uh, the enacti uh, enacting of, uh, of virtue by a filial son. So it, I, it looks uh, absurd. And of course, I will try to prove this one by searching in, in corpora, but I think it is ruled out. That, that, that's my experience. So. Uh, well, let's uh, let's go back to the to the handout. We are coming to the to the end of, of my talk. And this is, is one. So in the end, I uh, I uh, in the end I uh, I have come to the uh, conclusion that there are for for English it may be eight degrees of normalization, but for uh, classical Chinese three uh, three degrees for verbs will do. Well, the first one is no uh, nominalization at all, so it is this balanced verb, and then we have this uh, subordination, and in the end we have this nominalization for adjectives. It is only two, in fact, only two two levels of, of nominalization. Uh, and I try to here we have this possibility this. Uh, 
if, if we translate the text, so we should be aware of these possibilities that uh, systematically lie can mean that they hunt, hunt, that they hunt, hunting, and hunt as a noun, and not hunting one or hunter, because this uh, this happens only in individual lexical, lexical cases, but it is not a grammatical rule, but a word formation rule, I would say. The same is with hunted one. Usually it cannot mean hunted one, but for some some uh, verbs it it works because it happened in some way the same is with other with uh, other verbs as well uh, for i we have that they love loving and love this is uh, very uh, it is common but for adjectives it is different because um, systematically they can mean they can mean they are he is said they are said being said but also it can be a denotation of the property so it means sadness but systematically it, it can be nominalized uh, as the denotation of the object that uh, carries this property so you said one it is nominal process it, it is a normal process in classical chinese so uh, you can see also that this is the another distinction between verbs and adjectives in classical chinese so that's why i think these are two word classes although they are very uh, very similar and close to each other but still they are, they represent two uh, distinct uh, distinct uh, word classes also uh, so it's an, another, another, another nice proof of this. Then I then I uh, then one can take, for example, a sample of this, this is the very beginning of Sinza, and to apply this kind of uh, try to apply this kind of uh, analysis on this. And this is what uh, I, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go through it uh, sentence by sentence, but here you can see that we have uh, this, this bold bold type. So those cases that I think that are either subordinated or nominalized, and that this verb, which can be, which can be, uh, for example, this xue, for example, we can see if you st study, you cannot, you cannot, uh, you can never stop with it. So that would be a bit untraditional untraditional uh, reading but still it is viable but usually it is taken as really the last stage of nominalization uh, of verbs sure as a real noun studies not studying but rather studies with its uh, own particle process and other association and so on. it is not just studying but really one studies systematic uh, studies and so on so uh, i try uh, i try to uh, illustrate on this piece of text all these possibilities and how uh, various degrees of phenomenalization uh, uh, work and that they are ubiquitous one can take just the beginning of a classical text and to show how how they how they work so uh, so this is this is my uh, this would be my last word i would say <laughs> uh, the part of the talk, but I have some some answers to those questions from the last time, so maybe I can directly start with with answering those questions if uh, if you don't mind or the organizers organizers don't mind. Uh, for instance, uh, I have here this my explicit my explicit uh, uh, treatment of those of that one sentence that uh, I don't know someone someone asked asked about this one sentence from Shoyan, how, how it can be how it can be uh, analyzed so we have this where of course this is subject and this is object of the verb tai. something depends on something or consists uh, consists in uh, and uh, but both the uh, subject and the object of the locative verb uh, tai uh, is nominalized nominalized to to certain degree here it is full this is this uh, this uh, property nominalization which here full does not mean a rich one but richness the fact that someone is rich so it is a noun derived from adjective and it is a systematic process i would say and then the object of the verb tai uh, is jizu, which is uh, let us say subordinated uh, it is not maybe a real a real real noun jizu, but it is subordinated and it uh, consists of a verb and a and an object but again jizu to mean uh, what is enough or 
or enough uh, or, or sufficiency, let us say. It depends how we translate it and how we interpret it. But in a case, it is uh, it is nominalized. So this adjective do to be sufficient, uh, but here it is to know what, what is sufficiency or yes, let us say sufficiency. The same is then uh, true uh, of this Kuei Zai Chou Fei, where Kuei is uh, nobility uh, consists in uh, uh, trying to retire, let us say. And again, this Chotwei is object, so it is, let us say, subordinated. It is this kind of weak nominalization. And uh, uh, then this Cho is the verb, and its object is Twei, which is, uh, in a, we can say that is retirement of retiring. So it is, it depends. I would say it is rather subordination or weak nominalization rather than than real noun. Uh, at least that's my impression. But still, and you can see that uh, in fact one can prove that these uh, words all are just the level of the nominalization is intermediate and not the absolute one. Is that you can. You can think of inserting this j and pu here. This j is a marker of subordination, but not necessarily of nominalization. It depends how you, uh, what you call nominalization is the problem. I had this, I, I had discussed many times this with, uh, with Christoph Habsmeyer, because for TLS, practically there are only two degrees. Either it is verbal or it is nominal, and of course, uh, and it is not uh, easy to, uh, easy to, uh, to analyze those texts, if uh, in case, in that case, that one uh, thinks that there are more than one degrees of nominalization, then this is the problem. Usually, the system uh, pushes one into the position. So, is it a verb or is it a noun? But there's some. There should be something in between. So, can you see that uh, uh, you can? You can insert the j here, example, people's uh, richness, let us say, but at the same time, you can do it uh, uh, here as well. This people's richness consists in people's uh, knowing what is enough. Uh, but on the other hand, one can easily insert a pu here, the uh, not being rich of people is because of the people's not understanding what is enough or what is not enough. So at the same time, you can see that it still retains some verbal properties and that's why it is uh, some intermediate and not real nominalization in the strongest sense, because you can uh, you can use the ne uh, negative adverb here, pu, and it, it means that it cannot be a real noun, what, that following word cannot be a real noun because you, can, you cannot do this with, uh, with a real noun. So it is another, of course, another test of real nominalization or nomina nominalness. Uh, the problem is uh, the problem is that we have uh, expressions uh, which are like well uh, well entrenched and lexicalized with this pu functioning as a kind of prefix. So, for example, this pu xiang, which is inauspiciousness. Yes, and uh, I think it is a quite nice noun, but it is internally, it has this structure of a negative and originally uh, uh, an adjective, but as a whole, it is inauspiciousness. The same is true of punang, which means the incompetent, incapable, the incompetent ones. Uh, and again, this is real nominalization, it is those incompetent people, but uh, the word consists of a pre negative prefix pu and, and this this core uh, originally uh, adjective core so who is not always um, does not always mean that uh, the the word after after it is necessarily a noun but almost always it is a noun so so that is for this case i can show you what uh, what um, TLS makes of this uh, this expression uh, this is uh, uh, for example, it is under the, the, the synonym group or con concept dissatisfied, insufficient, and poor, but uh, these, these meanings in fact overlap and sometimes TLS is uh, uh, 
does not mind <laughs> over the pain <laughs> in this sense. And you can see this is a psychological, uh, this, is, uh, this is categorized as a complex uh, nominal expression, as a compound, a psychological compound feeling of the uh, dissatisfaction. Again, here we have is a compound, so not two words, but compound, uh, uh, the abstract noun feature insufficiency. And here it is, uh, in fact, it is uh, categorized uh, very uh, precisely. That is a nominal phrase, so the compound in this case, those who are short of means for living or production. But this compound is still explained as uh, originally a negative and an and a, uh, adjective or Verb here in TLS, and that it, all it is, uh, all this refers to some noun, some people, the people who are short of means for living, and it is pluralized usually. So this is a very precise, uh, precise label for this compound. But you can see that even TLS uh, uh, acknowledges that Uzu is one expression and not Pu and Zu. Uh, that that. Uh, so maybe Puzu we, we could take as one noun in that, in that analysis, uh, analysis before. The, there, were, there were questions about the applicability of this, uh, of this teaching <laughs> uh, to pr problems in, in translation. I I still don't have a good uh, I just don't 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 have a good answer to this because uh, no linguistics the goals of linguistics generally are simply not uh, easily matched with problems in translation so if you ask the generative grammarian why uh, how uh, how how could you use this generative grammar uh, for translation of particles text? You would be uh, surprised by the question. But still, I I, uh, I can repeat the one thing that uh, all these parts of our knowledge of uh, classical Chinese grammar form uh, uh, constitute our competence in that language and the uh, uh, the the better our our knowledge and competence is the better we translate, of course. <laughs> uh, I, I took one, and uh, here we can, for example, say how we can uh, apply this, uh, this competence in one sentence I took from, again, from Moza, which I made, known, uh, made notes on, uh, where we have uh, uh, at least five layers or four layers of nominalization. <laughs> uh, thus we have this uh, subject and, uh, and subject verb and its object. And the object is this complement clause, we say this applies to, or this speaks about some kind of fact. And the fact is expressed by, uh, by a subordinate construction, not necessarily nominalized, as we say, this is a weak, this kind of weak nominalization. This is the, the fact that something happens. And this is shown by this uh, marker of dependent construction with this, this uh, subject, uh, then object, uh, sorry, uh, verb and its object with this verbal or clausal again. And the subject shown is actually uh, this nominalized adjective, this is not, uh, the, the sage, but the shen means this this perfectly wise and uh, to be perfectly wise and shen here means of course those people that are perfectly wise. Uh, so this is one piece of, of the competence which uh, is related to to uh, subordination, nominalization, and so on. Uh, then we have this, uh, the fact that wisest ones do not fail in something. Again, we have this kind of uh, subordination. It is not a no, no nominal phrase, in fact, but it is, a, it is slightly nominalized again. Uh, so the wisest ones do not fail in making the policy of, this is this E Wei Zheng. This is the framework, and uh, this is the object. The shang xian and shenang is the object of the preposition of e. So again, if it is a it is a, uh, an object of a preposition, so it is uh, it must be at, be at least weakly nominalized shang xian shenang. Uh, so it is the process process of shang xian and shenang. <laughs> so this is showing respect 
uh, to the competent ones and employing the able ones. And again, the sien and nang are systematically nominalized adjectives, which then mean the bearers of the properties. So it is not uh, to be competent ones, sien, and to be able, but the competent ones and the able ones. So, this is one example of how it relates somehow to, to translating. So I think so simply one is not perplexed when uh, when one sees such sentence. Also, uh, if I when I go back to this to this to this list, I really think that one one should know what what is usually possible in that particular language and what is not possible what is not possible in that uh, language, and only then one can choose between those uh, remaining uh, alternatives. Uh, so, of course, sometimes sometimes it can happen that, that one uh, comes across one of these lexicalized individual cases, but that one, one has dictionaries and one has, uh, one has commentaries and so on. So, but it is usually not, uh, yeah, so either one knows it from dictionary as a kind of um, lexical knowledge, uh, but one cannot, but one shouldn't uh, one shouldn't disregard that there are only uh, there is a limited scope of possibilities so i don't know who who said this that now i think it was it was graham who said that there is a there is of course many uh, many possibilities how to how to translate a sentence a sentence but there are uh, infinite, there is an infinite number of possibilities uh, how to translate it in a bad way, in a good way, in a, in a uh, correct way. So there are usually you have several possibilities how to translate them. They are ambiguous, they may be three or five possibilities, but they are not endless. <laughs> but if you do not have that, do not have this competence, and you uh, uh, you are not clear about grammar of classical Chinese, then of course you have. Uh, this endless number of possibilities because you can uh, you can fill with it one way or the or the other. Uh, yes, so this is uh, this is uh, uh, this particular question. Uh, uh, then uh, there was a question about uh, TLS that you have to uh, sign in. That's true, but uh, if if you are interested in this in a regime of who, who, who can get a login and who cannot. So then you will have to consult either Christoph Habsma or Christian Sherman or, or uh, whoever else is uh, now takes care of TLS and run it. So I think Christoph Habsma or Christian Witten uh, should be contacted. I don't have any insight into these matters, but that's true that some functions uh, cannot, cannot be uh, cannot be used uh, if you if one is not uh, one is not uh, uh, signed it. Uh, there was a question about uh, uh, there was a question about introducing some bit, uh, reference books and so on for classical Chinese. I think. I really wrote uh, 70 pages on this. Uh, we com commented, uh, commented, uh, annotated bibliography for Oxford bibliographies uh, online. So this is the base. Uh, this is the best uh, place to go. Uh, I made a. I made a. Uh, I extracted some basic things from that from that list. But I think I don't. We don't have time here for going one going. Uh, uh, entry by entry and to commenting uh, commenting on it. So maybe if if, the, if there are uh, if there are more concrete uh, questions, so I I will gladly answer them. But I cannot uh, introduce you know textbooks and grammars and so on. So uh, I can I can I can show you the the file I. Yeah. That's what I can uh, uh, what what I can send Maria Maria. That's what, for example, I, I could recommend, but it would deserve some some commentary from my from from my part, and it is not time for that. But yeah, it is general works, textbooks, and phonology, Middle Chinese phonology, etymology, classical Chinese grammars, and so on. It is a very uh, I can say only one thing. It is very 
uh, very strange that there is no real uh, reference, uh, good real reference grammar uh, on uh, classical Chinese in English. In English, there is we don't have we have for very important for important languages such as Latin and Greek and Sanskrit and so on. We have very very nice reference grammars, very descriptive, uh, fit grammars. But for classical Chinese, we do not have any any one. So it is a it is I think a great mistake, <laughs> and uh, there are many problems connected uh, related to this to this fact. So uh, I uh, the the best one and the, is Ulrich uh, Unger's Grammatik des Klassischen Chinesisch, but it is in German and is uh, it is published uh, published electronically. And uh, for example, I like uh, as a linguist, not as a student. That is, <laughs> I like Gassman's and uh, Bear's Grammatik des Antichinesischen, which is sophisticated. It is, of course, it is. Uh, one can see the influence of genitive grammar, which uh, Robert Gassman likes, but still, I think is very, very nice. But uh, it is mainly it is a part of of a textbook. There are two volumes of uh, textbooks, and there is a grammar. As, as the third volume, this grammatic, this anti chinesian and so on. So there are, so this is a real problem that there is no no reference grammar of classical Chinese, as far as I know, and I maybe I, I, I would know, <laughs> uh, and so and so on. So you can you can use this, but uh, I really I I can really say that bibliographies uh, online will work. The problem is that I that I had to. Uh, limit myself to eight, I think it was eight entries in each paragraph. And that uh, instead of uh, some monographs, I prefer to uh, to list uh, articles there because they were in some way representative. So um, yeah, I would, this, this, uh, this particle uh, shortened uh, abbreviated list maybe could work better than that 70 pages uh, list for any, um, um, or many many strange domains like uh, post classical Chinese and uh, old Chinese phonology and the grammar of oracle bone inscriptions and so on. So thank you. So thank you. That's uh, that's all on my part. And I don't know whether yes, still several minutes <laughs> uh, for other questions. Yes, thank you. Um... And I, yeah, I do encourage everyone who has access to look at and consult um, Dr. Zadrapa's annotated bibliography in Oxford Bibliography, because it is quite comprehensive. If you have any more specific questions, uh, you can, we do have one question in the chat already. Um, so I know we're at uh, 90 minutes, but you know, if, if people don't mind sticking around for a little bit longer, we can ask a question uh, posed by Professor Zev Handel, and I'll read it now. He says, uh, suppose you have a diverbal noun and you cannot determine from the textual corpus whether it is lexicalized or not. If you had a time machine and access to native speakers, are there any synt syntactic tests you could use with the native speaker to determine the degree of lex lexicalization? I think, yeah, thank, thanks Zef, for this for this question. Uh, yes, it is a tempting question. <laughs> uh, I think I think one one could do this because one, in fact, uh, uh, does this for modern Chinese as well. Because these those two two languages, let us say, it's the two, two stages of the language, but maybe two languages uh, is all, all right as well. Uh, are somewhat somewhat different uh, and because the, the morphosyntax of classical Chinese modern Chinese have many many differences but still uh, and for example this uh, problems with ascertaining uh, word class uh, affiliation of, of words is uh, much less uh, uh, it is it's, it is not so difficult for modern Chinese because the problem of this uh, word class flexibility is is not so serious here. But still, we have many problems with word classes, and I would do the same what, for example, Kuo and Yuan Yulin uh, did for modern Chinese. So we have uh, uh, there are so many 
so many tests with uh, you give these points plus points and minus points and you compute whether that particular word is rather a noun rather a verb and so on so i think in general uh, it, it it would be uh, possible because i believe that there's a objectively existing what what classes and one could one could try various constructions for example i think uh yeah so i think it would be possible but uh, yeah including of course you can you can try the first thing as you know you can try for example at uh, negatives poor or adverbs and so on it is not uh, 100 percent reliable but still uh, one combines several several such text tests maybe one one can uh, one can one can say roughly <laughs> if, if one doesn't say uh, doesn't want to say roughly but precisely then still yeah this one can think of a complicated procedure and with these all distributional distributional tests we have for modern Chinese so that's my point of view okay great yes professor Handel says thank you in the chat um so I think um if there are additional questions maybe we can have participants direct them to us or Oh, I see, Madalena, if you want to ask a last question <laughs> before we wrap up, yeah. Yes, um, and actually, if the answer is too long, we can, we don't have to do it now. But when you were giving the example of to be, uh, to know to be intelligent and uh, intelligence, when you were talking mm -hmm. about the, yeah, how it is about, you mentioned that you believe it's more likely that it went from to know to intelligence than to be intelligent, mm -hmm. right? I was curious yes. to know how you determine those uh, scenarios when you have there you were presenting two scenarios and you were saying mm. I think the second one is more likely. How do you determine that? Uh, yeah, this bit because of the usual function of that suffix that usually again maybe there were several uh, several stages of this decline of morphology and uh, various uh, s suffixes and and so on and, and prefixes and so on but usually in uh, in in most cases this s suffix uh, turns other things into nouns so first yeah. you would have this dr to understand okay. and some that's something something that is nominal so maybe this intelligence and only then uh, to have an adjective because it is very uncommon to derive uh, uh, an adjective like dr uh, intelligent from a from a verb by any uh, any suffix it's very uncommon i cannot think okay. of any such example now so okay thank you you're welcome okay great um in that case maybe we can start to wrap up and uh i invite everyone to join me in thanking dr zadrapa for both of his lectures um and also just to mention if you want to keep up to date with the uh synology methods and synology lecture series which will continue next month and also in the spring uh you can follow them on twitter or visit the website um and a quick word about next week's uh, lecture topic we'll continue with historical linguistics with guillaume jacques who will be joining us to talk about historical phonology um and the Methods in Synology website already has some preparation materials for that lecture. Seeing everyone then next week. And thanks again to Dr. Zadrapa. Yes, thank you. I would like to express my gratitude for you you staying with me and to listening to this. Uh, uh, to this it was entirely things. selfish. <laughs> for many, for many people, <laughs> <exotic things. laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.